everybody. Uh, we have Trudy Benson here, so I'm just going to read her intro. Uh, Trudy Benson is an artist who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. She was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1985. She received an MFA from the Pratt Institute in New York and a BFA from Virginia Commonwealth University. Her work has been included in exhibitions at the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, Sparone, Westwater, New York, Saatchi Gallery, London, uh, Center of Art, Maymac, France, Museo de los Pintores Huaqueños, Oaxaca, Mexico. She has had solo exhibitions at Loyal Stockholm, Team in Los Angeles, Lyles and King in New York, Lisa Cooley in New York, Half Gallery in New York, Saison and Benetier, Luxembourg and Paris, and Ribordi Contemporary in Geneva. Her work has also been reviewed in the New York Times, Art Forum, Art News, and Modern Painters, among others. She is represented by Loyal Stockholm, Ribordi Contemporary in Geneva, and Saison and Benetier in Luxembourg and France. So thank you so much, Trudy, for joining us tonight. And I'll hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Karine. That was really nice. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, well, thank you also to everybody for um, inviting me to talk today. Um, it's, it, it's been really nice um, meeting everyone I met with today. Um, and so I'll just get started. So here's the, here's the nice. Um, you know, cover page of my slideshow I need. Um, oh, let's see, here we go. Okay, so I like to start with this painting um, because it's kind of the, um, the first painting that um, I made that has kind of led as my series progressed into what I'm making now. Um, I made it in 2012, it's called Paint, which is kind, it's kind of named after the um, imaging software, MS Paint, um, and um, it's, you know, heavily influenced by digital imaging software. Um, the, you can see the beige, beige line here. Can you guys see my cursor? You want to do? Okay, cool. So the, um, this beige line here, I was trying to kind of emulate like a, um, a, a track pad, but a more rudimentary one, whereas mine is moving really smoothly now. Back in the day, it would just kind of like jack around and you couldn't really get a really nice smooth line with that. Um, so these works were kind of based on the nostalgia for um, what I think of as my first um, kind of entry into making abstract paintings, um, which I did as a child. Um, my dad's a computer programmer and um, I remember one day I went to, it was like take your daughter to work day kind of thing. And um, I was just kind of like playing on his computer, open up the software and it was like, because you had all of these different tools at your fingertips, I was just creating without thinking about what I was doing. And so, um, so um, yeah, this was, this is kind of my, um, and this painting was quite large, 63 inches by 68 inches. Um, and so from there, I want to talk about Albert Olin. Um, this is one of his computer paintings. Uh, the computer paintings he made um, kind of continuously and alongside other series of work. Um, he started them in 1990. And I think the last one was in 2008. I don't know if this is the last one or not, but that was the last year he kind of um, worked on that series. Um, and I wanted to read something from the catalog essay. Um, um, the present work, Untitled, which is this painting, is an outstanding example from Olin's computer painting series in which the artist first introduced digital technology into his disruptive painterly practice. As one of the first painters to unmistakably incorporate computer imagery in his works, the artist liberated the formal boundaries of painting through the pixelated nature of his compositions. In his computer paintings, the artist creates an abstracted pattern, first rendering his composition with a mouse. The artist then prints, silk screens, and or paints these gestures onto his chosen material, canvas or paper. Often combining these techniques, regardless of the repeated patterns in his computer paintings, the artist creates varied and layered compositions. Composed on a computer program, the series is founded on the notion of seriality. 
Through the process, Olin instills the work with a sense of irony as the use of the human hand to perfect the final product destroys the legitimacy of the term computer painting. Arguably scornful of the artist's hand, using digitally rendered images, Olin appears to be questioning the skill of painting. In contrast, however, through perfecting the final image with oil paint, the artist celebrates the infinite potential of digital imagery. Disrupting, complicating, and obscuring the pictorial plane, untitled, this painting, assertively pushes the boundaries of painting and compositional structures, engaging multiple perspectives. Utilizing paper on canvas, the artist increases the dimensionality of the work and questions the limits of the pictorial plane. Um, so I, I really liked that um, when I came up, I actually came across his paintings um, after I had made that painting, a professor, an old professor mentioned it to me. Um, and um, I really liked how he had to go back in and kind of fix the painting. And that was just how limiting the technology was at the time. Um, Albert Olin began the computer paintings in 1990 after the purchase of his first laptop computer. The artist created a, cup, a couple of functional motifs within four years using a computer program on his laptop and continued to use variations of these motifs until he finished working on the series in 2008. <clears throat> While his earlier paintings employ a playful twist on historical subjects and methods of painting, the computer paintings reveal abstract images that were created with the use of a foreign tool. The limitations of computer programs at this time provoked Olin to finish and smooth out the staircased and highly pixelated lines by hand in order to produce a more desirable computer picture. <clears throat> the limitations he experienced with the computer program heightened a sense of irony. Albeit new technology, computers in the early 1990s were imperfect and required a human hand to enhance the final product. Meanwhile, the human hand destroys any authenticity of the term computer paintings. And that's from Garstedt Gallery. Um, so, oops, okay. And here's kind of an installation shot from his exhibition, uh, his retrospective at the New Museum called Home and Garden. So you can kind of see the scale and how, um, you know, this, this painting was on um, paper and framed and, and these are on canvas. So, um, and these are, you know, like I said before, they span um, many years. Um, and here's another example of the computer paintings that looks, you know, kind of completely different. To me, this um, almost looks like, um, um, well, first of all, it looks like much more contemporary than 1997, but it also looks like, um, you know, at first glance, it looks like a like just an oil painting. So I think it's just beautiful, but you know, looking closer, you can see those kind of um, staircase pixelated lines we were just talking about. Um, but you, there's also quite a bit more of the artist hand in this work. And um, so here's another, he, there's a funny little article that he, um, um, it's Albert, it's called Albert Olin on Albert Olin. So he wrote a little article about himself in Art Forum. Um, so he says, when I am in my studio, I don't think about how the final product will circulate as an image. My colleague Doku Pill once told me that a painting should always work as a stamp. It should look good in a very small reproductions or seen from very afar. I like that thought, though I don't know if it's true. I think that my paintings look terrible reproduced, yet I believe my own judgments about other people's art, even if I have only seen a tiny picture. Anyway, I think it's not possible to control how a work is received. Um, that really resonated to me because I think that's something that we're all dealing with now in the studio is, you know, how your work can, is perceived on the tiny screen um, versus how it's perceived in person. Um, and uh, that's just something that's, that's always, I mean, it's always on my mind, but there's, there's like multiple um, uh, ways to consider how you're painting. Um, is received, but you in the end have no control over it. And I thought it was funny how he says he believes his own judgments about other people's arts, even if he's only seen a tiny picture. <laughs> um, this is also a computer painting. This, this image is just like completely crazy to me. I love it so much. It's just like the craziest painting ever. Um, this was also in the, um, the Home and Garden retrospective at the New Museum. Um, and I think it's a good example of just like how how you know how much he really explored this idea of the computer painting and all of the different um, over the years you know um, 
this looks much different than the first one, but the first one was actually painted in 2008. So that's kind of funny. <clears throat> um, and here is one of my paintings uh, I made kind of um, also along that series where I think, you know, that grid is really kind of something that is, is almost like quoting that, that kind of, you know, early technology um, vocabulary. Um, but if, as you can see here, there's like kind of, this is, this is part of the painting where just all of the paint ended up falling off of the painting at one time because I was applying it so thickly on top of this really slick surface. So um, there, there is like a, there is a bit of a lack of control here in the work as well that um, you don't get, of course, when you're working on the computer. So that, that side of the work is really important to me where um, the texture, the thickness of the paint, the smell of the painting, um, the drips, all of that is, um, is a big part of the work for me. <clears throat> um, and here's my computer painting kind of made after I learned about and started looking at those Albert Olin paintings. Um, this was in my exhibition at Horton Gallery in um, 2013. Um, and uh, this painting actually has a cutout in it, right? literally cut into the canvas and took that triangle out. And there's a backdrop of a sprayed um, canvas that I attached to the back of it. So there's that added dimension of kind of like, of, you know, what is virtual and what is real. There, there's a actual hole in this painting. <clears throat> um, here's draw. another painting in that series. Um, as you, this is kind of where I started using the airbrush rather than a spray can. So you can see the line work got a lot more fine. Um, and uh, this is, um, that's the tool I'm using now. Up till then I was using spray cans. Um, and also here I've got a, a roller that I apply oil paint with. It's just an industrial paint roller that you paint walls with. Um, and then I've extruded paint out of the tube here. Um, yeah. So, and this one has kind of a hidden smiley face too. So that's fun. Um, here's Bops. This is gonna take me into my Elizabeth Murray segue. I just wanted to kind of give an overview of my work at the same time. I'll kind of intersperse it with my heroes and talk about them. Um, so, this, uh, this painting is called Bop. It's named after the Elizabeth Murray painting of the same name, um, which is slang for masturbation. Um, I don't know if it's female specific or not, but anyways, her painting is incredible. Um, this is another one where the cutouts are, um, the, are made with the raw canvas. Um, and I was, I was thinking about her shapes works and how even though this is kind of the, the these are kind of holes in the painting where um, it would be visually the furthest back um, there. They come forward because just of the stark um, hard edge edgedness of them. Here's Elizabeth Murray's bop. So um, yeah, you can see this is one of her um, later pieces. She was working on this, I think while she was still, while she was um, fighting cancer. Um, and I wanted to read a little bit that she spoke with Art21 about this painting in particular. <clears throat> so Art21 says, tell us about Bop. What's the inspiration behind it? Elizabeth Murray. Well, it has some predecessors. For a couple of years, I've been working with cutting out shapes and kind of glomming them together and letting it go where it may. Like basically making a zigzag shape and making a rectangular shape and a circular bloopy fat cloudy shape and just putting them all together and just sort of letting the cards fall where they may. And I don't know why I'm doing it this way. What I want more than anything else in my life and in my painting is, however I get there, for things to unify and for things to come together. And it felt when I first started these, which was exciting, well, I'm going someplace now, I'm working flat. It's not three-dimensional, even though the shapes are cut out and they have different kinds of perimeters. But I'm going to resolve these in a different way and I don't know how they're going to resolve. The psychological part of it was just starting something that I had no idea how to put together. Another part of it for me is to use very intense color or different kinds of color, intense color, pastels. 
I'd never worked with pastels before, which I'd always thought of as like sweet and cloying and sort of candy-like, not so much in this painting, but it has happened in some other paintings. So with the color and with the shape and with the drawing inside of the shape, really it's just simply trying to make it work somehow and letting myself really not know how it was going to happen, except that all these shapes are stuck onto each other in some kind of way, sort of like a weird fence or a weird lattice thing. And it's been very frustrating and really fascinating working on into these paintings. And I found with this particular painting that I just haven't been able to stop on it because I think one of the parts of working this way is that there are so many different combinations of things. It's like being a safe breaker in those movies where they've got their ear up against the safe and you're listening for the right click for the right cylinders to drop down. Sometimes it felt really like that, like I'm just painting and painting and painting until the right thing happens. And with all of my work, I think every artist has this. You leave it at night and you come back and you think, wow, I've got it, I've got it. And then you come back in the next morning and it's gone, it looks awful. So that this was really humanizing of her and just like a beautiful way to talk about making work in the studio. Um, and I also liked what she was saying about the lattice and hanging shapes on it because I think about my paintings that way um, where you could see the paintings before that had um, grids in them specifically, I was thinking about kind of you know, them being kind of the support and, and what connected all of these seemingly disparate elements together in the work. Um, and yeah, it's just, I also like the very end of that where she's kind of like, you that feeling in the studio where you feel like you've really done something great and then the next day you hate yourself and you hate your life and you're the worst artist in the whole world. That's so relatable. Um, and I have a funny story about Elizabeth Murray. Um, my, my parents, um, I'm from Virginia and I was there when, when, um, one weekend or one week, I don't know, Christmas break or something visiting my family and I was kind of sleeping on the couch because I was tired. My mom walks in, she's like, Trudy, I want you to meet somebody. I want you to meet my friend. Her sister-in-law is an artist. And I was like, oh, I'm sleeping. I don't want to get up, you know? So I just lied there and didn't get off the couch. And then um, my mom, my mother's very close friend who was down the street from us, Amy walked in. Um, and it turns out her brother is Bob Holman who is Elizabeth Murray's um, uh, widower. So <laughs> it was kind of crazy. It was like, oh, you happen to be um, married, you know, related to my favorite artist. So that was pretty crazy. Um, anyways, I like to tell that story. Um, and here is the beautiful Elizabeth Murray working on Bach in the studio. I couldn't resist this picture. Um, it's just great. I love seeing these historic photographs of artists in their studios. Um, here's another one flying by. <clears throat> this is like, you know, her, her canvases were a bit wonky and kind of placed together and overlapping. And the thing about seeing these works in person, if you haven't, they're just amazing. Like the edges are beautiful. There's just all these kind of drips coming off and um, they're just so completely rugged, but it's also considered as like part of the whole piece. So um, yeah, and this is Just in Time, which is about her falling in love with um, Bob Holman. So yeah, that was beautiful to share. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about um, also here's here's uh, a painting from I guess late 2019 called Circling Back. So it's more recent work. I did a bit of a jump um, and I'll show you why I wanted to talk about this. So I um, this painting was um, you know I was thinking about Jan Arp and you know a bit uh, when I was making that, um, I think there's another one here. Oh yeah, so you can see these shapes here, how they connect, um, they, they harken back to this painting. Um, and the funny thing about ARP is, um, so this piece is called Untitled Square, um, Collage of Squares Arranged According to the Law of Chance from 1916 to 1917. Um, and I'll just read you a little bit about this from the MoMA website. ARP created this collage in Zurich in 1916 to 17 at the geographic and temporal heart of the Dada movement. Profoundly affected by the trauma of modern warfare and the expansion of print media, ARP and his fellow Dadaists sought to radically rethink the very nature of art. They held reason and rationality responsible for World War I and in response, employed new anti-rational 
aesthetic strategies, including abstraction collage and the use of chance procedures. This collage fully embodies Dada's demands of the new art. According to his contemporaries, art made this work and others like it by tearing paper into pieces, letting them fall to the floor and pasting each scrap where it happened to land. Rather than ordering the page according to his own design, he ceded control to the random hand of gravity. The work is resolutely non-referential, no story, no picture, only torn blue and white paper. However, the grid-like composition of this collage may be evidence that Arp did not fully relinquish control. Careful examination also reveals that he used heavyweight, possibly fine art paper, and that the edges were torn on a slant to reveal their inner fibers. It suggests a counterintuitive interpretation that the work may be as much a visual representation of chance as a product of it. So yeah, like we really believe that all these squares fell at perfectly right angles and then he just glued them down, I, I don't know. But anyways, it's still a beautiful piece. Um, I love it. I love um, how, um, how he faked it. <laughs> Here's the other one. Also don't believe it's chance, but I really love this yellow rectangle, which is like perfectly lining up with the edge of the piece. <clears throat> and I have more about uh, Jan Arp. One of the founders of the Dada movement in Zurich in 1916, Arp challenged existing notions of art and experimented with spontaneous and seemingly irrational methods of artistic creation. Untitled Collage of Squares According to the Laws of Chance is one of several collages he made by scattering torn rectangular pieces of paper onto a paper support. He and other Dada artists embraced the notion of chance as a way of relinquishing control, a kind of depersonalization of the creative process that would influence many subsequent generations of artists. <clears throat> so the idea did influence lots of people, but um, I don't really buy it. Um, yeah, so then I'm showing you this. Um, oh, and that last little excerpt I read was from Jan Arp Chance Collages, um, Marjolene Van Herk Research Blog. Um, so here's my painting again, um, circling back, circling back to circling back. Um, and I wanted to kind of point out these squares that I stole. Oh yeah, here we go. Stole from Jan Arp. Oops, there you go. So, um, and here we've come to Louis Kahn, who is a French artist. Um, he's part of the surface support movement um, in France, which happened kind of around the same time as the artists were in that um, High Times, Hard Times, High Times show that was at uh, PS1 a while back. But um, it's kind of a similar um, parallel uh, movement, but in France. Um, so if, as you can see, these were, these were called uh, toile de coupe. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it just means cut canvas. Um, so this was, um, he would essentially take a piece of canvas, paint on both sides, make a couple cuts. And then like, so in, for example, I think he made um, probably three cuts here, um, one here, one here, and one down the middle. And then he just opened the canvas um, like a book or um, window shutters um, and so the wall ends up being part of the piece. Um, another idea um, with this movement is that all of the artists kind of their work could be like folded up and transported in suitcases so they would just kind of show up at an exhibition everybody would take something out of their suitcase and put it on the wall um, which is kind of cool kind of punk rock. <clears throat> so um, here, uh, this is from Louis Kahn's Persistent Vision by Rachel Stella. Um, Kahn's incision in the canvas produces flaps which open upon a space on the wall. This space is not part of the painting, yet remains integral to the picture. Thus his paintings, which, which interact with both the floor plane and the wall, investigate the space of non-representation, what is cut out and integrated within the painting. Um, this is from Theory and Matter by Raphael Rubinstein, which is in Art in America. Um, the toile de coupe works, many of which were, many of which feature large flaps of painted canvas that extend onto the floor, are always impressive. In combining the language of formless abstraction with a self-evident procedure, they tell us something new about painting. Kane composes like Ellsworth Kelly, in distinct units where color and support are one. 
But unlike the American, he lets us see how the painting has been made and invites us to imagine how it might easily collapse like a tent or a house of cards. And here's an installation shot of a bigger piece of his where it kind of actually comes out into the space. And these are just gorgeous in person. And I, that's what, another thing I really like about these works is that they're, you can just tell exactly how they're made by looking at them. Um, this was the painting that, um, um, I think it was Roberta Smith. Somebody basically, there was a review of this show and it was pointed out that the, this, you know, was the precursor to Joe Bradley's robot paintings, which I thought was kind of cool because it really is, but these are much simpler. They're just um, cut canvas and just like unfolded and hung on the wall. Um, okay, and okay, here's my peach portal. There's kind of the sideways yon arp um, shapes again, um, but I wanted to bring this, uh, show this in relation to Louis Kahn because I was, I think, um, I'm thinking about these shapes as kind of a similar, as you can see, let's see, right here where they're cut and then kind of folded up or down. Um, I'm kind of envisioning this. And when I'm making the works, I cover them in masking tape and I actually cut into the masking tape to make these shapes. So um, there's a bit of a harkening back to Louis Kahn, Jan Arp, um, collage artists. Um, so, and in a way there is a bit of an element in chance, of chance in the work because um, usually I don't see what um, the painting will look like until I take all of the tape off of the painting, which happens about three times um, during the uh, making of the work, sometimes more. Um, here's Jonathan Lasker. Uh, he was one of my first kind of like, um, when I started making abstract paintings, he really, um, I, you know, I got into his work big time because, you know, they're so accessible. I think that they're extremely legible paintings you can look at them and they're like, um, you kind of know what you're looking at. Um, it's really easy to understand these as abstract paintings. Um, and they're also like really great looking. They're just like beautiful, bold, kind of poppy. I love them. Um, so, let's see what I have. And he also, um, this is like really thick impasto painting. He makes very few paintings. I, I was lucky enough to visit his studio. Um, he was really nice and gave me a bunch of catalogs and he also gave me coffee that he made with, um, uh, you know, like second time using the coffee grounds, which I thought was pretty funny, but he likes it, he liked it that way. So he's cool with it. Um, oh, and here is, my painting called Painting, which was made during the time when I was kind of obsessed with Lasker. And I think that you can see this kind of legibility in the work where I was making its one point perspective. And I think here you, I, the way I look at this painting is, is almost like two figures in a room and, or on a stage. And that's how I um, entered into making abstraction. So, um, um, okay, so do I have another Jonathan Lasker? No. no, okay. So I'm gonna um, leave this up and read a little bit about Jonathan Lasker. Um, this is, um, oh yeah. So this is by Adriana Campbell um, for Art Forum. A case in point is the plus sign at Golgotha 2014, which features three forms, um, each defined by a distinct palette and type of mark making, a cluster of marks that hold a central core, marks that undulate like gestures and marks that disappear because they constitute a form, a plus sign or a cross. From left to right, the first set of marks is made up of secondary colors, the next of primary ones, and the third, the cross of pastel pink and blue. I'm realizing now I, sh I forgot to include this image, but um, you'll just have to imagine it, I'm sorry. Um, each form sits in an interior relationship to another on a two-tiered platform and the grid highlights their purpose perspectival relationship on the platform in a manner that recalls that of the figures in Perugino's The Delivery of the Keys from 1481 to 82. In Renaissance painting, one point perspective allowed a temporal unfolding of a spiritual moment. Distance between foreground, middle ground, and background could delineate the passage of time. The grid, meanwhile, presents a continual now, a material present. With this work, Lasker gives us both perspective and the grid, which simultaneously bolster and hinder one another. 
and thereby evokes the long history of painting and its diverging, diverging associations between distance and time. I just thought that was beautiful. And she is an excellent writer. <clears throat> um, and then I have another quote by Barry Schwabsky for Art Forum. Lasker's impasto must, must have a patent on it, by the way. Almost graphic in effect, frosting thick, but somehow never painterly. It's always about image, never material. Um, and this, that reminded me of the um, Lichtenstein brushstroke lithograph, which is just like this graphic representation of an expressive um, gesture. I think it's in here somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Um, but yeah, and in a sense, it's, it's about, even though these are so thick, the paint is like, like crazy thick and he puts it on with this like palette knife this big and um, um, it's not really about material, it's, it's, um, it's about the image because they end up being so graphic, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. Um, yeah, and I'm kind of trying to, this was my little riff on the Lichtenstein brushstroke print, um, trying to make this kind of expressive, expressive gesture into a graphic mark, but also adding all this material to it. Um, here's scratch pad and um, you can kind of see the cast shadow there, which is why I like to include this because, um, you know, this was also my, my attempt at making an expressive mark uh, into a graphic mark. And these are kind of like, um, you know, absent-minded doodles, but made very intentionally and slowly by squeezing paint out of the tube onto the canvas. Um, here's my four RL, RLs, um, let's see if Lichtenstein, yep, there it is. Um, yeah, so Roy Lichtenstein, uh, another guy who's great in my heart. <laughs> um, uh, so this was kind of just, um, and you know, I, this these marks are, I've extruded paint out of the tube and it's that Winton oil paint. So it's like really thick and the tube openings are like super big. And so it's like four um, like lines in a row. And then I flattened it with um, a squeegee to try to make these like super graphic um, Lichtenstein or Lasker-ish marks. Um, but there's also this like, these are these drop shadow computer window screens open. So it's my riff on this beautiful, um, I think it's a lithograph, maybe it's a screen, but I'm not sure, from 1965, um, which is kind of like, poking fun at abstract expressionists. Um, here's my cutout painting, another one. This is a smaller painting, so you can really see the shadow here. I think the photographer had two lights pointing like top and bottom for some reason. So there's shadows on bottom and top. Um, but here's where I started really thinking more about the collage. Um, but instead of, you know, the white shapes on top, instead of them being cut out, um, they're actually like popping out into your space. So they, you know, visually, you know, the white would read as a whole as, as blank canvas, but they're coming out. So there you go. Oh, here's Mary Heilman. I love this little painting. Uh, it's called Little Nine by Nine from 1973. Um, and I wanted to read something by Anne M. Wagner for Art Forum about uh, Mary Heilman. Um, by 1969, when Hellman, who had arrived in New York after receiving her MFA at the University of California, Berkeley, excuse me, turned from object making to painting, New York-based abstraction was slowly sinking into a worn out slump. Clement Greenberg's hegemony was beginning to unravel and the artists he patronized would soon feel the pinch. Frank Stella's sallow days were behind him. Agnes Martin had left the city. Mark Rothko's suicide was imminent. Robert Ryman and Ellsworth Kelly were both working steadily granted, but so distinctively as to be inimitable by younger artists. Not that Highland seems to have ever resorted to simple mimicry, despite the frequency with which other artists of her generation have used it as a tool. Instead, she relied on coming to terms, as all serious abstractionists must, with the most basic issues art presents. What world can a painting summon? What does it offer to the mind and senses? Should it aim to disclose the contingency of its making or strive for an effect of presence so complete, so vivid as to seem foreordained? 
or is the point to erode the inevitable barrier between the viewer's present and the painter's past, between the now of looking and the then of making? The great benefit of operating with an abstraction, of course, is that its self-imposed limits thrust such questions to the fore. Color and surface and pattern, mark and system and grid, like all the successful abstract painters before and hopefully after her, these are constants Heilman varies and thereby reinvents. Um, so uh, this little painting is, is like, I love it. Um, one of the reasons I love it is because it's, it's super simple. Um, it's a painting about the grid, but it's, it's you know, wonky and uh, handmade and it doesn't really, you don't really think about um, technology or anything like that. Um, but you're, you think more about um, weaving or, you know, textiles because of how she basically, you know, if you look at this painting, you can see she applied the red paint um, and then she scraped into it to reveal the black paint beneath. But some of these lines go over, some are going under. So it's, it's almost as if she's weaving these marks as she's making them just very quickly and off the cuff. And it's just a beautiful little painting. <sighs> and I really like that playing with space and, um, you know, and so then I wanted to show you this painting where I'm, I'm, I kind of do that sometimes in my work. I mean, it's not as, it's not simple and perfect and beautiful like Mary Hellman does, but there's these elements of, um, of things going behind, things going on top, um, you know, this yellow line is kind of weaving in and out with the pink. And so your mind kind of um, kind of moves around and follows that. And there's this, you know, illusion of, of depth in the work. Um, so this, that's my, yeah, that's pink feet. And here's Warp and Weft, um, another one where you can see kind of the, um, the way the elements are almost woven. This yellow line is, um, or yellow line like shape is oil paint. Um, and this is the, this, this layer, the blue layer with the squares painted on it is acrylic. So it's not actually painted over the yellow. It's just, you know, I taped it off and everything. So um, yeah, there's that weaving element there and a little wonky gray on top, so. Thank you, Mary. Um, and, oh yeah, I like this, um, this quote by Mary Hellman. Well, I didn't know how to make a composition, so I chose the grid. Most of them are cool, hard-edged, austere. I wanted to do something else with the grid, not be so rigid about it. So that's kind of, kind of cool. Um, here's my ZZZ painting, which, um, yeah, th these, these, uh, Past, last three paintings were in my recent show in France um, and my friend Jason Stopa wrote my um, wrote the press release for him. He actually mentioned um, textiles and like, you know, quilts and in relation to the pandemic and how much time we're spending in our domestic spaces, but that it was kind of cool that um, he, I, I never mentioned um, anything about thinking about weaving uh, to him, maybe, maybe he, just got it from that title, but you know, um, yeah. So here is ZZZ, um, which is the title is kind of named after the shapes you see in the painting, obviously, which I wanted to make this kind of loose, crazy um, grid made out of Z's. Um, yeah, so it's like a, it's, it's a bit of a grid painting as well. Um, here is Jack of Hearts, which is just beautiful. Um, it's this like checkerboard painting uh, with this like weird, I think, and I read something where she called these like ghost shapes or something, but to me, they're just blood and it's, um, it's pretty cool. But I just like maybe just a little bit of drips here, a little bit there. So she painted the black over the white here, but here she painted the white over the black. So just that cool kind of visual play. Um, 311 Castro Street, another one where this is painted you, there's almost some some type of painting underneath you can't really see and then you know this these squares are 
the blue is actually painted on top of these colored squares instead of vice versa, or maybe both, you know, but yes, I love her weaving of color. Here's red, yellow, and blue knot. That's something about this. Maybe I don't. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, and hers, she's like scraped into the paint here, painted over. So I just like like the things I'm drawn to in her work is is the simplicity, the use of color, um, the compositions, everything's just gorgeous, but also just like your mind can kind of follow how she's thinking about making the work, you know, and it's and it's in such a way that you can kind of work it out yourself and um, just gorgeous. Um, oh, here is a descend. So this is from my solo show in 2018 um, at Lyles and King from Closer Than They Appear. Um, and so these are, this is kind of my all over series. I was speaking with somebody about um, this today. And um, so, yeah, the paintings have this kind of all over effect. Um, the background ends up being this very solid layer that just drops further back on. Um, there's a lot of, I wanted these to really feel like collage paintings that you could, I wanted them to feel really tangible and that you could almost kind of move things around with your hands. Um, excuse me. Yeah, here's an installation there. I um I did a I did a mural with um I sprayed paint with my air compressor on a wall in the gallery and then um, um hung a painting on top. So there you go. Here's Stanley Whitney. He is an incredible colorist and painter, and um, you know, he's making paintings about squares. Um, so I wanted to read a couple of quotes by uh, by Whitney that were inspiring to me. Um, I follow the paintings wherever they take me. If the painting goes out the door, I follow it out the door. If it goes out the window, I follow it out the window. Uh, here's another one. I start at the top and work down, explains Stanley Whitney. The, that gets into call and response. One color calls forth another. Color dictates the structure, not the other way around. Hmm. Whitney's vibrant abstract paintings unlock the linear structure of the grid, imbuing it with new and an unexpected cadences of color, rhythm, and space. So here we have another one. How to speak to trees is a later one. You can see, I just really like this simple move right here, this one stripe turning into the square. So I want everyone to see it. Um, and here's my stack painting. Um, yeah, so yeah, these are um, these are the squares are all very nicely organized here. Um, um, you can see the kind of collage elements. I have this this green square out to, on top of this multicolored square, but behind these stripes. So there's there's lots of that uh, kind of weaving I was talking about before. You can see here too. This was in my show at um, Team Bungalow in LA, which no longer exists, but it was a really great exhibition space. This was also in that show, Ultra Blue. And here we have Laura Owens. Um, so yeah, she's she's another, she's an artist. This is a huge painting. There's like screen prints. And then I think this is either very thick oil paint or acrylic paint that she's kind of um, put over top. And they're meant to look like your, the finger tracings on a, um, on a, um, on your phone or any touch screen. Um, yeah, here's my dot diamond dash. So this was one of my um, computer paintings from around the same time. Um, so you can see these, uh, this is like meant to be like, I don't even think it looks like this anymore, but in the old days of Photoshop, you had the lasso, the, like the lasso tool, the, um, the selection tool, if it's, if it's geometric and it would kind of blink black and white and it was really cool. So this, um, yeah, there's Dot Diamond Ashes was in my show at Horton. This is touchpad painting literally a touch pad painting. This, these are meant to be lines. I actually had a crappy PC that I made these lines, the black spray lines and these white lines on top. I made some drawings with it and then printed them off and then <laughs> copied them, kind of tried to copy them on a large scale on these works. And here we have another dancing, blinking black and white line. Uh, control V, which means paste. 
So I was kind of like cutting and pasting here virtually in my mind. <laughs> um, here's Avery Singer. She's a, um, a young artist. These are like big, um, I think they're all like 100% spray, but I just like these worlds she's creating with this, all these different planes. She's got all these areas like taped off and then she sprays them and just like, they're just really kind of um, complicated and beautiful. Um, here's John Raffman. He did all of these like paint wrapped rooms. Um, this one's a Georgia O'Keeffe one where it's like a weird waiting room that he's like wrapped in a Georgia O'Keeffe painting, which I thought was so cool. Um, oh, and here, here's Catherine Bernhardt, one of my movie top five. She's amazing. Um, she's, um, she's like a natural painter. This is like, you know, um, this is like, what I would aspire to be like in the studio is just, I think she's just so fresh and she just has a really natural hand, like, um, you know, she makes it look easy. Um, and so I wanted to read um, what Roberta Smith wrote about her and her, she's, she's, Roberta Smith has reviewed her so many times in the New York Times, but this was in 2014. Mrs. Bernhardt emerges as a Latter-day pop art process painter who looks to color field painting for her strong soaked color and fast, no margin for error technique. Ms. Bernhardt paints with great economy and panache as Warhol might have without silk screens. So pretty cool. Kudos to you, Ms. Bernhardt. Um, here's Lucas Blaylock. Um, these are like digitally manipulated photographs. He's pretty amazing. So he's kind of like moved. It's like another, you can kind of see the line here, um, but this is also 2012, which is interesting. It's at the same time as the Laura Owens paintings. And I think he was kind of making similar work even before that, but it's this touch screen mark that you can kind of see here um, uh, that he's manipulated uh, on this photograph of a wrinkled picnic blanket or something, but it's just beautiful. Um, here's my ultra more. This is like a more, re this was made at the very end of 2020. So. Um, I started using a like fancier airbrush. So I'm, I've been like getting a bit more intense with this sprayed background um, and um, thinking about that more pattern that shows up when you have like two layers. It's like two layers of, of mesh or two grids that go on top of each other and they kind of at, a, at certain angles, they get really wavy. So um, that's kind of what that painting is about, more grid. Um, here's Green Tangle, um, where I've kind of brought that dotted line back, but it's just, um, you know, not so literal. It's a bit more colorful. Um, here's Lilac Line Alias. I think at the end, I'm just kind of showing you recent work because I want to show <laughs> recent work. So here's Merge Visible. Um, um, which is a Photoshop command when you flatten all the layers together in one. So it's kind of like for a while, I wanted to distance myself from that um, digital software conversation. But now I've just, I've been kind of, uh, it just because it ended up being the only thing people talked about my work. So, but I felt like I was just a painter at heart. Um, so, but I'm bringing that back because I never stopped thinking about painting in that way. And these like in these different layers stacked on top of each other. So. Um, try and own it a bit more, but also not be so literal with it. Um, here's Lemon and U. So I've got these like, this is an N, this is a U kind of woven over top of each other. I don't think I'm very good at titles, but <laughs> it's Warp Zone. Um, I played Nintendo in the 90s, so <laughs> that. Um, and here's a, oh, I think at the end of this, this is the end of the slideshow. So I'm just going to kind of go through, these are like studio shots and like kind of close ups and things I took with my phone because I wanted to just give you kind of a peek into the studio a bit um, while I finish up here. So you can kind of see the surface. This is like the raw canvas, which would later be sprayed, which is actually the second layer I make. And you can see the tape bleed, which I really love when that happens. Um, here you can see a close up after I've sprayed. That's similar, same painting. Um, here's the painting in the studio. It's the natural light and you can kind of see the edge of the painting there. Um, here is in process shot when I have the painting taped off and I'm just adding oil paint to it. Excuse me. 
um, some works in progress in the studio. So you can see the first layer is actually this acrylic layer. The spray layer comes after that, even though it's visually the background. A little close up, so you can see the edges of everything, which I are really important um, in these paintings. There's that same painting, but you can see the whole painting. The nice studio, a little messy studio shot. Here's a, a kind of a taped off layer so you can see how things go. Um, some, some nice bleed because the spray is like bleeding onto the acrylic. Um, a new painting, another new painting, and that's the end. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Trudy. That was really great. Um, I really like that you put a bunch of other artists that you look at. Um, so I just want to invite everyone now to, if they have questions, you can either write them in the chat or write your name and we can turn your video on. Um, but to start, I'll ask a question. Okay. Well, one of my questions is like when you, you know, in the order that you had made your slides and presented some of your paintings, you really made them in a direct relationship to another artist. Mm -hmm. Do you think of them as like an homage to an artist or just like continuing the conversation or like just like bringing us like your inspiration? Um, all of the above, some like that um, different paintings would be different things. Like with the Bach painting, the Elizabeth Murray painting, that was definitely an homage. That's just kind of my love letter to Elizabeth Murray. Um, but a lot of the other paintings were just kind of like, here is kind of an insight into my thinking behind the work and me trying to add to the conversation, but also um, being pretty transparent about my influences. So. Um, and I have one more question. I was thinking of when you showed the Stanley Whitney work and you read the quote from him about how he follows the painting. What is your process of preparing for a painting? Like, do you do, do studies, but then of course, like, do you also do like digital studies as well? Um, I actually don't do any studies. Um, I don't really do anything digitally with the paintings, except for sometimes towards the end, I'll take a photo. If I don't know what to do, I'll take a photo and then kind of draw on it in my phone, in my brushes app, <laughs> but um, to kind of see different possible, you know, ways to finish the painting, but I don't keep a computer in my studio and I don't, you know, my work is, um, it's kind of like, um, it's like, that's why I like that quote because he talked about being a call and response because I work the same way where I'll, I'll kind of, I usually start a painting with a really vague idea or even just a palette that I have in mind. And, um, and then each layer is kind of a response to that. So um, yeah, there's no studies really. Okay. Um, we have a question from Nikki and she asked if you have any books about painting or painters that you would recommend. Um, I really liked the High Times Hard Times book, which I lost. I was looking for it because I wanted to put some stuff in this talk about it, but I have no idea where it is. But um, yeah, it's a catalog um, um, for the show that was at PS1. There's just some great essays in it. Um, i trying to think. I mean, um, I have been having a hard time reading lately just during this whole year. Like I've just been watching too many movies, but I think, um, and I, ha I mean, have a lot of artists, the Eric Parker book, um, it's got the like pink pages. Um, let me just grab it real quick. This is a really good book. He has like quite a few great books, but this one's called Colorful Resistance. This one's really good. So um, yeah, just um, visually. And then the vitamin P3 book is really good as well. And I, oh, also there's, it's called Art and Feminism. It's a Fiden book. That's really great. Thank you. Those are great recommendations. Um, okay, I guess I'll just shout out if anyone has any other questions. Okay, we have one more from Scott. And he says, do you think the role of the abstract painting today is different than the role it played when folks like the Abex painters were working? The role, um, well, 
I guess, I mean, that's a, that's a complicated question because I don't really know what their role was back then, but I think, I think as far as how they were critically received, there was, there was not that many critics. There's Clement Greenberg um, and people were championing them. Um, and I don't know if we're getting that kind of same type of critical um, um, investment to the same extent where I think the artists in that period were really like put on a pedestal. And, and now I think it's, I mean, the art world's a different place. There's so many artists, um, so many more artists than there were back then. So I think it's like a bit harder to get the same type of attention or, um, or so, you know, to have any kind of impact on the world. But, um, you know, and I don't know if that's really, if that's really important anymore anyways for abstract painters, there's not, you know, what, what can we, um, I don't know what, <laughs> it's hard to say what our role is, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm kind of making paintings in a cave, especially in the past year, but um, I think there's always like, you know, if you're talking about the role of the abstract painter, to me, I think about like, who am I making these paintings for? And at times it's like, who is in my studio? Sometimes it's Elizabeth Murray. Sometimes it's my husband, who's also a painter. Sometimes it's just for me, you know, and, but so it's like, um, I think it, that's like, from my perspective, that's very personal, but I don't know, um, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's a big question. <laughs> Okay, and here we have another question. I'm so drawn to your bravery and experimentation within abstraction and making. Do you feel like there is a difficult or painful element in the process of painting over what was over what was there before? Has this shifted as you've grown and evolved as an artist? A follow-up question would be, how do you deal with the risk factor of using material in a way that can end up changing the painting so absolutely into something else? So the, um, let's see, the first, can you read the first question again? I yeah. Do you feel like there is a difficult or painful element in the process of painting over what was there before? Has this shifted as you've grown and evolved as an artist? Yeah, so I actually made a few paintings. I think they were like 2011 or 2012. They were kind of just all about that where I kept painting over the painting, but it was just like big giant spots. So the, the end result painting, there was all this surface texture built up, but it was just a big gray spot. Uh, it was a, it was a hideous painting, and I was trying <laughs> trying to be smart, but it wasn't a good painting. But um, you know, it is hard sometimes some, to not paint over certain areas that um, that that show up in the painting. That happens like every single painting. Like, I don't want to cover up that particular um, little tiny place where this. Thing touches this thing, but that's the only way, way that that line can go, you know? So yeah, it is, it can be painful. <laughs> um, but um, at the same time, yeah, I've, I've actually been quote, pretty unsuccessful at covering things up because they don't work. So whenever I try to do that, the painting never works out, so. And can you tell me to read the second um, part, Green, again? Yeah, the follow-up question is, how do you deal with the risk factor of using material in a way that can end up changing the painting so absolutely into something else? Yeah, so I mean, because of how I work with the spray being on rock, um, well, it's clear, I use clear gesso, but it, it looks like raw canvas. Um, and then I end up with, there's also areas where there's really impasto oil paint. So, and I also work with acrylic, so I can't put acrylic on top of oil. Um, and if I put anything on the areas where there's just spray over the um, clear gesso canvas, I can't really erase it. So there's not a lot of editing I can do. So I end up um, unstretching paintings a lot <laughs> if they don't work out. So, and that's become uh, much easier to me uh, to do over the past year, just um, being trying to be more frugal with materials. <laughs> Um, and not having things so easily, you know, can't run to the art store anytime they need something. So it's been a lot easier to kind of just like scrap a painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Trudy. This was really great. I think, I think that was the last of our questions. Thank you guys. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to talk. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Judy. Have a great night. You too. Bye.